Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ramya Ravi Shankar. I'm the general counsel of How Good. Uh, and I uh, have spoken to some of you in this setting before, but just as a reminder, uh, my background is in food, sustainability, and regulatory enforcement. So I'm really excited to speak to you all about uh, regulations that affect the food industry. Um, and How Good is an independent research company. SaaS data platform called Lattice. Uh, we actually have the largest database on food product sustainability with uh, information on more than 33,000 ingredients, chemicals, and materials. And uh, through our database and our services, we help some of the world's largest food brands, retailers, suppliers, and food service providers measure, manage, and communicate their sustainability impacts. Today, we're going to be speaking about two new laws that were passed in California um, that uh, have the potential for a really large impact on the sustainability landscape um, generally and on food companies uh, more specifically. But before I get into it, uh, and again, those of you who've come to my talks before will know, I would like to start off with a quick disclaimer. So uh, I'll just give everyone a couple of seconds to take a look. Uh, I am not your lawyer. I'm not providing you legal advice. Uh, and uh, everything that we're sharing is based on current understanding, but it doesn't mean that the understanding and the facts on the ground might change. Okay, I'm going to move right along. So our agenda for today, we're going to start with some table setting and context uh, around uh, these laws coming about. We're going to get into the nitty gritty of what these uh, two laws entail, how they compare to some other disclosure mandates that are either proposed and in the works or also um, finalized and um, under implementation. We will look ahead and uh, comment on what this means for companies um, and We'll end with, uh, I'll pass it over to one of my colleagues who will talk a little bit about the How Good Solution and we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Please don't wait uh, until that section. If you have a question as the presentation continues, please drop it in the chat. We have moderators who are able to track this and can coordinate with us so that we're able to address everything um, by the time we get to the Q&A. All right, so um, background, context. So. As many of you are probably tracking, a lot of companies are touting their efforts to respond to climate change. And there's so much information out there, sometimes it's hard to verify whether it's accurate or to even compare apples to apples. Um, more than two thirds of companies in the S&P 500 actually voluntarily report um, to CDP their carbon emissions and their carbon management plans. And uh, apparently from the latest statistics, 88% of the top 25 food and beverage companies have actually made um, commitments in line with the science-based target, uh, target in, targets initiative to reduce their carbon uh, footprints. So there's a lot of sc attention, scrutiny, appetite in this space, and regulators are increasingly turning to disclosure mandates and creating reporting obligations so that these uh, disclosures can be compared um, and can be uh, standardized across the board. Uh, there are reporting requirements coming out in the European Union, the United Kingdom, New Zealand. In fact, just earlier this week, uh, public companies in Brazil uh, are going to be, it was announced that they're going to be subject to providing annual sustainability and climate-related climate disclosure starting in 2026. But we're not here to talk about some of those jurisdictions. We're going to look a little bit closer to home uh, uh, in the United States and look at what has been happening in um, California. So as I mentioned, California passed two new laws earlier this month um, that have the potential to fundamentally change corporate climate accountability. And the reason that is the case is California is the fifth largest economy in the world. So what uh, businesses need to do there, are go it's going to impact how they operate all over. Um, and the law brings in you know, subsidiaries of companies that didn't previously have to report their emissions. And um, what is in effect playing out is given California's market size, they're able to leverage climate disclosure as a standard practice in the United States and perhaps even abroad. Uh, there's actually a lot of precedent for California um, being a first mover in the climate space. In fact, 
uh, the state's policies around electric vehicles actually propelled the federal government to then take up um, laws that uh, promoted and accelerated the use of electric vehicles. So we can see how California can be the harbinger for how other states and the federal government itself uh, positions themselves around climate. These two laws, which again, we're gonna go into in depth, they um, are, uh, they have the potential for a lot of impact because this is the first time that large publicly traded and privately held corporations um, are going to be required to make public their impact on their environment, including uh, scope three uh, supply chain emissions. Um, and uh, they're gonna have to report on how climate change is impacting their bottom line. So, I know there's a lot of text, but I will go through each of these items in depth. Um, I'm going to be comparing or I'm going to be looking at the two laws in question, the Climate Corporate Data Accountability Act, or SB 253, as it was called when it was in its bill stage, and the Climate Related Financial Risk Act, which was SB 261. Um, so for both, uh, like I said, they impact both publicly listed and privately held companies. Um, for the Corporate Data Accountability Act, it impacts any business that has over a billion dollars in revenue or more um, uh, that does business in California. And for the Climate Related Financial Risk Act, that impacts any business with over 500 million in revenue that does business in California. So of course, if you're impacted by the Financial Risk Act, you're certainly going to be uh, impacted uh, or sorry, the other way around. If you're if you're impacted by the Corporate Data Accountability Act, you're certainly also going to be impacted by the Climate Related Financial Risk Act. Um, the Data Accountability Act requires the reporting of scopes one, two, and three greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, as a reminder, scope one involves uh, emissions from sources that a business directly owns or controls. Scope two is any emissions from electricity and energy sources that a company purchases. And then scope three, which is often the hardest to measure uh, and usually is the largest proportion of a company's greenhouse gas footprint, is emissions uh, from uh, the supply chain. They're indirect sources that the business does not own or control. Uh, for the Financial Risk Act, uh, the disclosures involve what are considered material risk um, uh, to the immediate and long-term financial outcomes uh, in uh, accordance with the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. And um, the companies have to report on this material risk, as well as any measures that have been adopted to reduce or adapt uh, to these financial risks. In terms of timelines, um, the uh, Data Accountability Act requires that the scope one and two emissions are reported out starting in 2026, looking back to the impact and emissions from the prior year. So measurement and um, quantification all have to be for the operations in 2025 and need to be reported out in 2026. Uh, and then scope three emissions have to be reported starting in 2027, and they need to look back on the previous year. Uh, the Financial Risk Act, on the other hand, is uh, starting in 2026 and every two years after that. In terms of um, the kind of verification and supplementary information businesses need to start thinking about, for the Data Accountability Act, uh, the law as it's currently written requires that scopes one and two have um, what is considered limited assurance from an independent third party assurance provider starting in 2026 and reasonable insurance uh, starting in 2030. And those are standards that have been set by um, ISO, uh, the standard settings body around greenhouse gas reporting and accounting, but basically um, limited assurance is, uh, you know, a slightly less rigorous evidence gathering procedure. Um, it uh, comes to the standard of being able to say, a third party being able to say, nothing's come to our attention that can, makes us believe a material error exists with this number. Whereas reasonable assurance is a little bit more robust 
it requires the third party assurance provider to say there is no material misstatement. So it's a slightly, um, you know, slightly nuanced uh, wording between the two, but those are the two standards that um, ISO has set in terms of assurances. And that's, those are the, those are the types of assurances uh, the law requires reporting companies to meet and verify with a third party. Um, and then for scope three, the assurance standard hasn't been set yet. It won't even come into effect, it looks like, until 2030, but it looks likely that that will also require or require companies to meet a limited assurance standard. Um, the Climate Related Financial Risk Act, on the other hand, it's a little bit less um, robust and broken down, in part because the type of information being disclosed are not numeric values and calculations in the same way. They are material risks. And um, in terms of verification, the law requires simply that the risk disclosure is verified by an independent third party provider. Uh, in terms of the non-compliance uh, consequences that companies can face, uh, while one has a $500,000 fine, for non-compliance, the other has $50,000 fine. California has been clear that um, a holistic set of factors will be uh, considered when these fines are deployed. So um, things that could work in a company's favor are like, how much have you actually tried to comply? Was it just ignoring the law or coming close but missing the deadline by a little bit or missing some other piece I you know previously reported uh, in a compliant way but this year for whatever reason things got away there are mitigating factors that can affect the amount of the fine which is why it's up to a 500k or up to 50k but as a com company who cares about sustainability as all of you um, do uh, from a reputational perspective and a PR perspective it is something worth considering and taking into account these fines are just, one piece of the non-compliance uh, collateral. Um, in terms of next steps for the uh, Corporate Data Accountability Act, what, um, what is set to happen is the legislature, the California legislature has passed this law. Now it's up to the state agency, CARB, the California Air Resources Board, to set the actual nitty gritty regulations on how to implement that law into practice. So they're going to be um, setting uh, more granular uh, standards on how, like the exact reporting timeline. So when in 2026, the reporting needs to start or um, in terms of what the third party assurance providers credentials need to look like, or, um, you know, what the verification process, the third party verifier has to undertake uh, and so on and so forth. So the actual um, details around this are still to come in terms of the effectuating um, bodies. As for the Financial Risk Act, CARB simply has to give itself the authority to levy these fines for non-compliance um, because a lot of the framework around reporting, they're following the um, TCFD, as I mentioned previously, around how a company needs to uh, measure and communicate its uh, uh, material risk. The reason this is a big deal, we've already talked about it um, affecting a much larger swath of companies. But the other reason this is a big deal is that this is preceding a lot of momentum that initially existed in the United States from a proposal that the Securities and Exchange Commission had made around climate disclosures. Um, the difference here is California's laws affect not just public companies like the SEC's proposal would, it also affects private companies. And the SEC, when it first uh, initiated its proposal, got a lot of pushback around the, re the requirement that scope three or indirect emissions uh, needed to be reported. Whereas California has you know, stuck to its guns and said, scope three is going to be part of the disclosure landscape. It might have a longer timeline because it's harder to measure, but companies can't simply opt out. The California laws, in fact, are actually more akin to the EU um, and its 
corporate social or sorry corporate sustainability reporting directive or CSRD which passed last year um, because they have similar frameworks they're tied to like the greenhouse gas protocol they have similar um, approaches to communicating both emissions as well as climate related risk um, the only you know or the key differences between the two are the revenue sta uh, revenue standards that would make a company um, subject to the um, EU uh, directive versus the California directive. For example, um, in the EU, other than companies that are based there, so for US companies that are operating in the EU, um, their uh, balance sheet needs to exceed 20 million euros and their revenue needs to be over 40 million and they have to have uh, more than 250 employees over the course of the year. So in terms of revenue criteria, slightly lower than what California brings into its ambit, but in terms of the reporting requirements, a lot of crossover. And then more uh, granularly, the CSRD actually has additional requirements around uh, companies' impact on biodiversity and pollution and like general impacts on society. So that is another material difference that companies need to be mindful of when they're thinking about these two. So in terms of looking ahead, um, you know, the like I said, the state regulator still has some rulemaking it needs to conduct and, and go through, but um, that's going to take shape over the next year. But a lot of large companies are already collecting and preparing to report out the metrics that are required by these California laws, uh, in part because there's so much overlap with what Europe has proposed and what the SEC has proposed. Um, but as you all are thinking about these issues and preparing for these laws, you should consider a few things. One, you know, climate reporting isn't really like the uh, the singular purview of one function, it really needs to be embedded across or the organization. So you might be, um, you might want to think about establishing a cross-functional team, you know, one that leverages management, operations, legal, finance, so that the act of reporting really is owned across groups as opposed to having one go-to um, business unit or function that owns it. Um, and you need to be thinking about what kind of internal systems and um, internal protocols do we need to put in place from a data governance and disclosure perspective so that we can meet the requirements of these laws. Also take the time to identify appropriate outside advisors, third-party assurance providers. You know, when you're looking at data providers from a sustainability perspective, you wanna think about how do they substantiate calculations and disclosures? What kind of scientific evidence are they leveraging? What kind of international frameworks and standards like the GHG protocol or the TCFD are they following? Um, how often are they reviewing and updating their research and their data? And for food companies in particular, you want to make sure that the providers are focused and specialized in agricultural production, and they have the ability to incorporate data for raw materials as well as processed materials in a supply chain. Um, they can integrate, you know, supplier level data um, at scale. They can um, incorporate location specific and crop specific data because all of these metrics are going to impact how the ultimate calculations and disclosures play out. Um, I'm going to actually, uh, I, I'm going to like uh, pause right now and pass it over since this is a natural time to do so to my colleagues on the product team, because a lot of the things that I've been talking about from a data provider perspective are the kinds of things that How Good is really great at. So I'll turn it over to our head of product marketing, Aaron Tanner. Thanks, Ramya, and hello, everyone. Um, I would like to, as Ramya mentioned, just share a little bit about how good and how we're supporting food companies like you in um, really navigating and responding to reporting and regulatory requirements as they continue to arise. Um, so I think the most natural starting point is um, as some of you may know, How Good has been fully dedicated to food um, since day one. So we've really spent the past 17 plus years mapping global food supply chains, um, really working to unlock the data and insights that we all need in the food industry to truly drive change. Um, and we have an in-house team of agricultural experts, carbon specialists, LCA researchers, um, food analysts, 
that are reviewing an exhaustive list of over 600 data sources on a regular basis. Um, and in, on, in doing so, we've um, been able to synthesize sustainability data for over th 33,000 food ingredients and materials, as Ramya mentioned earlier. Um, we've also been partnering, um, since we've been specialized in food, with food companies across the industry, including leading grocery retailers, CPGs, restaurants, suppliers, um, and that's really um, enabled us to assess the impact of well over 1 million um, global food products. And I'm happy to say that we work with six out of the 10 world's largest um, food companies to measure, reduce, and communicate the impact of their products. And it's really through this level of research um, and deep integration in the industry that um, we've been able to build the world's largest sustainability database for food products and ingredients. And Ramya, we can go to the next slide. Um, and that database is really what powers our um, SaaS platform Lattice. So Lattice has been built to automate uh, carbon footprinting and carbon reporting, and has been built in direct alignment with the GHG protocol. Um, so I think that's what we want to focus on for our topic at hand today. Uh, one of the most unique aspects of Lattice that makes it really well suited to respond to regulatory requirements like the California um, climate laws is that it provides super granular carbon footprinting right out of the box. Um, and essentially what that means is that you can measure your scope three emissions with a really high level of accuracy without any primary supplier data. Um, so how does that work? So because of the breadth of our database that I mentioned, we have granular data on specific crops and locations. And this is really key because most of, or many of the databases, the general databases that you guys are probably familiar with are relying on broad proxies and use global averages. Um, and then on top of that, on top of that, our algorithms are able to predict things like the most likely sourcing location or processing location or manufacturing location um, of your products and ingredients. So really the reason why this is important is um, with Lattice, all you need to get started is basic product information um, or whatever information that you have today. So um, we're able to integrate as little or as much information as you have so that your ability to report emissions um, as these regulations come up isn't dependent on the intricacies of data collection. You can um, export carbon footprinting data directly from the platform um, in a report that is aligned with the GHG protocol, which is super important. Um, and then you'll have access to all the documentation, including the methodology, the data sources, the um, and any other uh, accompanying substantiation. And then um, I think just the other bit that I want to mention is the dynamic nature of the platform. So we've heard, um, and I think Ramya touched on this as well, that one of the biggest challenges of carbon reporting is consolidating and managing the data across your organization. Um, so Lattice not only brings all of that data to one place, but it also ensures that it's always up to date according to the latest scientific research and reporting requirements. And so this makes it you know, super easy to access up-to-date reports um, kind of on demand without starting from scratch each new time that, um, that you need a report or new guidance comes up. Um, and then your team also has access to historical reports for any kind of auditing. Um, purposes. And then the maybe lastly, but um, most importantly, perhaps is um, that Lattice grows with you. And what I mean by that is that you can start with, with what you have today, which is, you know, as just basic product information. Um, but as you gather more supplier data, um, and as you continue to kind of like progress along that data collection process, we can continue to con incorporate that data to improve the accuracy of your reporting. Um, and you have the ability to streamline that process and actually um, manage that exchange of data and information directly within the platform as well. 
So I um, will yeah pause there and um, would like to transition to the Q&A section. We're happy to answer any questions that you have. Feel free to drop them in the chat if you haven't already. And we have um, our team here, including myself and Ramya, um, as well as Liz, um, data scientist on our research team, and Nina, our head of product, um, here to answer any questions that you have. So Ramya, maybe I'll ha hand it back over to you to start um, sure. fielding. Thanks, them. Aaron. Um, so one of the questions we've received so far is whether if a non-California-based company is doing business in California, do these laws only apply, apply if the amount of business they're doing is above the $500 million threshold? The answer is no. So if you um, have over $500 million in revenue in the past year from anywhere, from from uh, you know your operations across the board, but you also happen to do business in California, then you are brought into the ambit of this rule. And doing business in California could be as light touch as having a warehouse in California, selling to some customers there. Um, and then it could be obviously much more high touch as well as having your manufacturing operations or your, uh, you know, your company headquarters or whatever else uh, the case is. So. Uh, that's one of the reasons this is so impactful. If you are a large company, you're likely already doing business and have some sort of nexus to California. You are going to be caught under the, the purview of these laws by your revenue thresholds. Um, okay, I think we've got a couple of questions that our, our, um, our data scientist Liz actually might be the right person to answer. One is if a business in the supply chain is in, is in California, and um, reporting its emissions independently, wouldn't their California customer uh, be double counting those emissions in their own reporting? So a report of scope one, two, and three emissions is specific to that company. So within a single company's report, you shouldn't have any double counting of emissions. Um, but if you have multiple companies within the same supply chain, so that you're doing business with each other, then there is double counting amongst companies, um, but that's by definition of these different scopes. Um, and if you want more on that, GHG protocol actually has a very good FAQ question on double counting amongst different scopes. Thank you, Liz. Um, I'm going to keep, I'm going to stay on you for another second here. There's another question. Is there a risk that scope three could be double counted among companies, partners, retailers, brands? Yes. Uh, this is because again, you're within the same supply chain. So the farmer that grows the crop that then another company makes an ingredient out of that, then a manufacturer buys to make a product, but then another retailer stocks in their store, the emissions from that initial crop would be within each of those companies um, reported emissions if you're looking at scopes one, two, and three. Um, but this is why you never aggregate companies' emissions across a region. It's really so that company can understand where all their emissions come from and know all the potentials that they have to reduce them. Thank you. I got another question here around the um, revenue thresholds. Does the 1 billion plus revenue threshold apply for the year the law or reporting requirement begins? Yeah, so um, for, the, um, for the Climate Accountability Act, um, the 1 billion, the, the reporting starts in 2026. So if you're a company that earns a billion or more in revenue in 2025, and you have to start reporting out on 2026, you're going to be doing so. Um, and similarly for the um, Climate Risk Act, if in 2025 you had 500 million or more in revenue and you did business in California, you'll be reporting on your risks in 2026. All right, um, we're at the end of time. Clearly there's a lot of interest and excitement with what Haugen um, speaks about and offers. Um, I believe our colleague Kate has dropped a link in our chat for um, more resources. Uh, I also want to socialize to you all the next webinar we're holding, which is on November 9th, uh, regarding mastering the carbon footprinting automation process at the enterprise level, which given these laws is going to be increasingly useful as a tool for all of you. So I encourage you all to sign up um, and I thank you for your time. We hope to be interacting with you all very soon. Thank you. <laughs>